Every time we get up in the morning and look in the mirror, we have a reflection of the personality. We see ourselves as others see us. And if conditions are favorable, we also have a certain sense of temperament or individuality revealed through the structure and expression of the features and the general attitude of the body. The personality, of course, must use the physical form as its peculiar instrument. But it would be a mistake to assume that even the objective personality of the individual and his physical body are identical. The body, of course, acts as a visible indication and also supplies the mechanism by means of which thoughts, emotions, impulses, and instincts can be released into objectivity. But the personality itself is actually also invisible, except through such manifestations as it can produce in the body. And there comes a time when we should examine the personality rather carefully and wonder why we find some individuals rather engaging, interesting, vital, and others the reverse. Also why we carry around with us an invisible, intangible atmosphere composed of our feelings, our attitudes at the moment, and the long enduring pressures of temperament. Today, there is a great question arising as to which is the most important factor in the molding of man's objective personality. Is it environment? Or is it heredity? A third, less considered possibility is the individual himself. And as time goes on, it is likely that this will take precedence over the other two possibilities. The individual manifesting into this world comes in contact with other individuals. Each person is a minority placed in an environmental situation which requires constant adjustment. Also, we know that very few individuals are completely contemporary. That is, they have no complete adjustment with the times and places where they live and under which they function. Some persons are geographical misfits, others historical ones, many philosophical misfits, and a few uh, even religious. This misfitting means that these persons have not accomplished a complete integration with their present circumstances. They are living in the past or in the future. They are living under some code, spiritual, ethical, moral, legal, not quite consistent with their times. Most such individuals like to believe that in some way their codes are superior to the prevailing. These, in many instances, are correct, but at the same time, they do represent lack of adjustment to the moment. Now, modern psychology heavily stresses the importance of this adjustment.
personally, it seems to me that it is not as important as we like to think. The only important thing is that where there is not adequate adjustment, there is greater demand upon the resources of the individual. If he chooses to live by his own code, if he chooses to depart from tradition and contemporary patterns, he must be prepared to adjust his life accordingly. He must view his own personal conviction as sufficiently important to justify certain sacrifices and certain problems which will inevitably arise. Now we know that our contemporary patterns are far from adequate. We realize that we are still living in a social structure, very imperfect, and therefore not in any sense of the way, a word, a fulfillment of our greatest hopes and desires. This environmental pattern has not only many inconsistencies within it, but a considerable number of absurdities. Many of the things we do are unreasonable and irrational, but they are sanctioned because they represent majority attitudes. The individual, therefore, to make a complete adjustment to society must not only be as wise as his social order, but also as foolish. He must make the prevailing mistakes. He must involve himself in the contemporary inconsistencies, and even, in some instances, disasters. If his own personal judgment is such that he does not wish to cooperate with that which to him is evidently inadequate, he is out of adjustment. Now, whether he is out of adjustment in the sense that he is wrong is a moot question. He may be out of adjustment because he is right. But this kind of rightness, as we have said, requires courage of conviction in order to sustain it under uh, the general uh, non-sympathy of his associates. All of these factors together have made it inevitable that since the beginning of time, the human being has lived a dual life. He has a life within himself which is important to him, a life which he tries to preserve and maintain and protect. He also has a life in contact with other persons, a life which almost inevitably requires compromise, also defense. He has discovered through time that his deepest and most sincere instincts will not be understood or appreciated by the majority of his contemporaries. He also realizes that the presentation of his full and real nature to public observation will in all probability result in hurt, in damage, economic and social, and that he cannot afford to wear his consciousness on his sleeve. Through the course of ages, then, the individual has gradually developed a protective mechanism, a mechanism in which by dividing his resources he sustains two distinct uh, ways of life. These ways of life are usually internal and aspirational, external and factual or practical. These Practical compromises uh, present in their turn a number of difficulties. Nearly always a compromise leads to further compromises. The individual who attempts to be popular must make a great sacrifice of his own character to attain this end. The individual who desires to be himself at all times will not usually be popular and must also, therefore, make sacrifices to the preservation of his own individuality. 
Of course, the entire situation depends largely upon the integration of the individual himself. If he is right, if his convictions and concepts are true, and if his own inner life is strong, these become the important guiding factors. But for one individual who is so completely and totally right, there are a thousand who are merely stubborn, who not having any clear insight, are still determined to follow certain willful courses of their own. These courses do not represent superiority, simply eccentricity. Where this exists, the sacrifice of popularity to the preservation of eccentricity is also a doubtful achievement. We must then examine each individual in many ways in order to determine to what degree his personality is legitimate and to what degree it is merely a sophistication or an assumption which has no foundation in his own conviction. We may also say that the human personality, very much like the shell that protects the snail, is exuded from within the character. Personalities come from inside. They are the result of the need for some defense against the aggressiveness of environment. In many cases, we use the house or the home as a symbol. The individual who has lived a difficult and stress-ridden day returns to the privacy and sanctity of his own domicile. He feels that in his home, with the doors closed, he has a certain right to be himself. And he protects that right, and the law protects it. And in any individual guilty of unwelcome uh, entry into a house may be appropriately prevented from repeating such an action. Each person's home is his castle, where he may, according to his own abilities, uh, express himself. If this expression is unfortunate, destructive, or negative, the home then becomes unendurable. The personality, therefore, takes this place of a kind of house. It gives us a protection within which and behind which we can be ourselves. As, as such a, an instrument, it has usage, but it is very easily abused. We know, then, that what we term personality is largely a result of certain stimuli from environment. In this sense, that certain situations come up in daily living or in the broad pattern of our present social practices and usages. These occurrences call upon the individual to meet them in one way or another. If the pressure from the outside is inconsistent, with the natural instincts of the individual, he begins to build a wall from within himself around this pressure area. He gradually defends himself instinctively without any conscious realization that he is doing so. This practice, which has been uh, involved since the very beginning of human history, has resulted in the strenuous growth of the personality equation. Today it is dominant in the majority of lives. Another interesting and important uh, point should be mentioned. As the individual flows through into the personality patterns, using all kinds of, of defensives and offensive methods of protecting himself, he may build a very tangible an almost complete image. This personality image he can also mistake for himself. Gradually it comes to his mind that he is 
his personality. That the personality is the total of his true being, and whatever it reveals is true. Little by little, and particularly under a materialistic culture, we have therefore thrown more and more responsibility and weight upon the personality. We not only use it as a protection, but we attempt to press it forward into various fields of activity, depending upon it for success, happiness, security, and all these things. Actually, the personality cannot supply any of these things. It exists as a protection, a kind of garment worn by the person. And this garment can never and should never be confused with the wearer. Yet on so many occasions we even go further. We confuse a person and his clothing. We assume that the well-dressed well individual is a well-integrated individual. This does not necessarily follow. We assume that when we see the person fully attired in whatever style or manner he chooses, that we are seeing the real person. So by degrees, the perpetuation and glorification of the personality has become habitual. Until today, it is very rare indeed to find the individual who is capable of clearly distinguishing between the person and its manifesting instrument. It is also well to bear in mind that the personality, because it is a defense organism, does not represent the total nature of the individual. It represents only such parts of his nature as have been awakened by reminiscence and have been brought forward because of need. Thus, in most cases, the personality probably does not represent more than a fractional part of the individuality behind it. It only represents such parts of the individuality as are immediately useful on a protective level. It should naturally and does follow, therefore, that the personality lacks the reflective and psychic parts of the nature. It lacks philosophy, it lacks wisdom, it lacks understanding, because it is the production of emergency. And wherever there is an emergency, there is a comparative lack of full function. The person in an emergency does not bring into play all of himself, only such parts as may protect him and bring him through a crisis. The nature of civilization also does not call forth from within man his own total being. In an era of materialism, for example, such as we are passing through, there is little demand upon the ideological content of man's individual nature. The demand is entirely on a material level. Therefore, the personality, in order to be adjusted, must emphasize material things and does not emphasize mystical or apperceptional overtones. The personality is a continual compromise between the life behind it and the world around it. This compromise often becomes uncomfortable. The personality is uneasy. It does not have the sense of support from within that it requires. It is almost orphaned by the very being that projects it. It is not regarded with the full respect of either the world or the individual who has projected this personal shadow. We know also that the personality becomes the instrument by means of which certain neurotic and psychotic tendencies seek protection. The individual builds protective walls around weaknesses. 
And because of this tendency, the personality often appears strongest where the inner person is weakest. In all many instances, the personality represents a polarized opposite of the, of the being that has brought it into existence. If the person is hypersensitive and easily offended, he may build belligerence as a defense. If he is naturally a quiet person, he may develop a very active personality. If he is naturally inclined uh, to be scholarly, his personality may emphasize his social graces. Whatever seems to be deficient, by which he would be adjusted to the world in which he lives, is produced in an exaggerated form. And one of the most common and complete of these exaggerations is what we call sophistication. The individual appearing very worldly engaging in a great variety of activities to indicate that he is well adjusted when actually he is frightened to death inside. He may also have a sense of great security in the personality and where this is exaggerated it bespeaks his own internal insecurity. Thus the personality is frequently in total contrast and represents an exposition of what man is not, rather than what he is. In this way, it is an illusion, because it is a false face. It is a front which is not true to the person who projects it. This is another example of man's compromise with honesty. And it is typical of the world and organization around him. We know, for example, in industry and business, that all great corporations present most affable personalities. They try in every way to convince us that their primary purpose is our service, that they are struggling, striving, desperately concerned uh, with our needs and our desires. What they fail to point out usually is that they are essentially in business for profit. This is behind the front which they build. So behind the personality of the benevolent organization, there may be a great deal of cupidity. And behind the personality of the benevolent individual, there may be selfishness and there may be a despotism of attitude and conviction. Technically and naturally, in the construction of personality, the individual desires to be popular. He wishes to be considered friendly and sociable. He wants to be accepted as part of the group in which he lives. In order to achieve this, he desperately polishes the exterior part of himself, developing a high lacquer finish, often over a comparatively inferior material. This finish and this polish that he attains, however, is vulnerable, and where the personality is built too inconsistently and with too few roots in a solid internal it is easily broken or destroyed. The individual who loses the protection of his personality feels that he has lost the protection of psychic clothing. He feels himself to be revealed without protection and without uh, uh, shelter for the instincts and attitudes which he actually possesses. From the beginning then, throughout life, we work desperately to build up personality. It starts in childhood, in fact, in infancy. And one of the first things that the incoming life must recognize is this need of adjustment. And this adjustment is usually at the compromise of personal desire. 
The child learns that when it does certain things, it will be applauded. It learns that when it does certain other things, it will be punished. No one wants to be punished. Most people like to be applauded. At the same time, and more important still, everyone likes to do what they want to do. If, therefore, they observe that the things that they want to do bring punishment, it is necessary uh, to give this matter some consideration. As a result of this circumstance, the tendency is to conceal such desires or attitudes as prove unfortunate in action. The individual does not desire to change his ways. He does not say to himself, I will no longer hold attitudes that have gotten me into trouble. He does not attempt any program of self-education. He simply decides to keep to himself such uh, beliefs or such concepts as cause trouble. He continues to hold them, continues to love them, and continues to practice them whenever possible. But he has realized that when an emergency arises, he must restrain them and must slip behind a bland appearance which will not reveal uh, these unfortunate or pressureful instincts. As he does this through childhood, it becomes more and more habitual to slip behind this personality. He begins to know also that his associates are not mind readers, that if he plays his part well and carefully, if he is a good actor, if he can uh, vitalize his personality convincingly, that he can go on have his friends, mingle in society, be successful, and still not change his basic attitudes. It seldom occurs to him to really question whether he should change them or not. And here, of course, is a fine moral point, a matter of considerable ethics. If his attitudes are better than his conduct, Certainly, he should not change them. He should, however, try to find proper means for expressing them through the personality structure. I have talked to a great many persons who insist that they want to be kind, generous, and understanding, but that they have been so hurt, bruised, and wounded uh, in their efforts that they have finally retired into themselves and keep their opinions and attitudes completely private. I've watched such individuals and have listened to the stories of their adventures, both fortunate and unfortunate. And I am reasonably convinced that the majority of them have not been completely honest with themselves they have not really been afflicted or punished because of good conviction. They have not been penalized because, essentially, they wish to be better individuals. They have been penalized because their wishes and their attitudes, while idealistic, were not sound, were not truly the attitudes of enlightened person. For example, take the individual who has a naturally generous instinct. He will tell you that if he practices this long enough, he will be economically impoverished, destitute, and must depend upon charity for survival. This is not true. He would like it to be true. But the fact of the matter is, that no one is impoverished by intelligent generosity. 
He is impoverished only when generosity itself is in some way perverted within him. Many individuals are not generous because of a sincere instinct to generosity, but because they find a great deal of personal, selfish satisfaction in being generous. Therefore, in order to win the applause of other foolish people, they try to overwhelm their friends and associates with tokens of their generosity. They bestow their means or their time without proper thoughtfulness and without any real regard for the effect of their action upon the other person. It requires great wisdom to be wisely generous. And those who are wisely generous are not disillusioned. In the first place, to be disillusioned, you must have an illusion. And one of these illusions is that people you do things for must forever be grateful and must be at your beck and call from then on. This attitude is bound to get into trouble. And the scarred, bruised citizen retires again behind his mask, quite certain that the world is a heartless, unappreciative sphere. Actually, the personality as the persona or mask is only necessary to the person because he is not wise enough to live without it. There is no essential reason why man cannot flow from his internal conduct through his outer life in a pattern of almost complete consistency and harmony. All these defenses that we build up become a mutual pool of defense. Everyone gets together, each one behind a mask, each one seemingly unaware that others are behind a mask. He takes them on their face value, but expects them to understand him on his internal value. I know one instance of this kind which involved a group of people interested in a rather curious belief. Several got together for a party. The party was on an entirely social level. The talk became exceedingly mediocre, as usually happens. The only way it could be animated was with liquid refreshment. And the more of the refreshment, the more the animation, and the less the integration. It became a complete pattern of small talk. In the midst of it, by some chance, perhaps because of that extra libation, one of the persons gained the courage to bring up a subject that was of basic interest to him. He did so apologetically, because he was convinced that he was in an assembly of morons. The uh, other members included him among the morons. In an instant, the entire occasion changed. And this person who had falteringly, hesitantly, dared to interject an idea into the situation was immediately the center of a great deal of attention. He suddenly discovered that every person present was interested in precisely the same ideas. The conversation increased, the libations decreased, and the evening became a success. If this one person hadn't broken through, no one would have recognized or realized that there was a stray thought anywhere in the assembly. Everyone was hiding. Hiding behind the conviction that the slightest exhibition of intelligence would be detrimental. This happens time and time again. This compound defense mechanism actually conceals most people from each other. And in a desperate effort to be what they are not, 
groups lose the precious opportunity of being what they are, which would be far more interesting and far more valuable. Now it may well occur uh, that under some conditions uh, the, a majority in a group will not be interested in anything in particular. But this cannot be depended upon. We are not able to realize fully that this world is made up of individuals in trouble. There is something lacking, something necessary, something desired by practically every human being. Meeting him upon this level, and in this way evading the personality mass, we can discover that each person is interesting, is vital in some way, and may make a definite contribution to a common interchange of valuable ideas. Now there's one other difficulty that the personality presents. Once we have gotten it well developed and have brought it through the various stages of its infancy and adolescence, it may become highly dictatorial. The personality, therefore, is not always willing to cooperate in the sense of submerging itself into a common pattern. We are all afraid to agree with people for fear they will dominate us. We are afraid to disagree with them for fear we will lose their friendship. We are afraid, period. We are therefore more inclined to let well enough alone and drift along in any situation that has been halfway possible. If we want to let down the personality barrier, one way is to become receptive to a degree. If we are forever pushing this mask forward, and it, of course, is a little expressionless at best, we neither encourage nor vitalize the interest or desire of others to come out from behind their masks. Thus we have battles of masks. We have evenings of individuals sitting around with immovable expression fixed in a socially correct leer. <laughs> we have pat phrases and cliches which we use constantly. They roll off the tongue, but they are not associated with the mind in any way. <laughs> to uh, prevent such a situation from arising, we must also realize that the primary purpose of life is not the aggrandizement of this personality. That at best it is only a figurehead on the front of the ship, and the figurehead contributes very little to the management of the vessel. In fact itself, it was a survival of primitive superstition that a god or godling should be placed on the bow of the boat. Actually, the personality if it is permitted to relax, uh, can become far better, a, a greater use uh, in the distribution and communication of ideas. Thus, in the defense of personality, we frequently close our mind uh, to the contributions that others might make. The sophisticated individual who wishes always to be considered superior to an occasion finds an appropriate symbolism by incessantly talking. He must dominate every conversation. He must have an invaluable idea at any moment. Usually he does not have these ideas, certainly not in the variety and distribution which he would like to assume. But by continually, aggressively advancing his own personality, he loses any chance to profit by the thoughts, ideas, opinions, or attitudes of other people. He is there merely to make sure that he dominates, or at least 
that his personality is not in any way compromised. Actually, if this type of individual would sit quietly in the midst of a group, allowing others to express themselves, he would probably gain a richer and deeper valuation of human nature. He does not believe that other people are important because he never gives them a chance to be. He must always have leadership in order to sustain this front, which has become identified with himself and which he is willing to die to protect. If we can relax this personality to a little degree at least, we then become open to experiences about other people which will help us to break through their masks. We learn more about people by observing them, listening to them, and perhaps in quiet occasional conversation with them on their own level, than we can possibly learn by attempting to dominate every situation in which we are involved. This domination simply intensifies the personality mask and contributes nothing to our true orientation in life. Emerson was quite correct when he said that there was no human being alive who could not teach him something. And as our primary purpose here is to learn, it is not good to have good ideas simply bounce off of the personality armament. If we refuse to accept these ideas, we are impoverished in our understanding of other human beings and therefore actually inadequate to form or make a correct adjustment with them. In the theater, of course, personality is very important. And to the average actor, it is a financial and professional asset. He is hyper-conscious of personality. And he is constantly changing the masks which he wears, because of the roles which he depicts. To him, therefore, the appearance is real, because he must convey it. He must be the person whose part he plays. He must be the character that he is impersonating. This is the reverse, however, in the real world of life. It is far more important that the personality agree with the individuality than contrary. It is the purpose of man to release himself. And the personality is an intangible but very real instrument for that release. If, however, it becomes a crystallized policy, if it has built only objectional defenses, it cannot be a channel for the free communication of knowledge from one person to another. Some, therefore, gain the reputation of being highly opinionated. It means that there is a constant motion from within themselves on the level of opinion. And this motion is so intense that they cannot be helped or served by other people. All other things being equal, and knowing the personality game reasonably well, we also realize that Man has certain instincts that are even stronger than personality. One of these instincts, of course, is love, which can break through. Another instinct that is exceedingly powerful is the desire to help persons in trouble. A comparatively indifferent community in which no one knows anyone is involved in a local disaster. Immediately, everyone is friendly. The moment we see our neighbor in trouble, we rush to his assistance. But while we see him going along complacently, we do not even bother to speak to him. Whenever we see a friend in trouble, our sympathies immediately break through the personality wall. We want to do something about it. We have one clean, clear 
instinct to serve. This is a very important thing, because life is a magnificent theater of mutual service. And there is nothing which more completely gives expression to our own real nature than such conditions as inspire kindliness, thoughtfulness, generosity, and honest concern. By means of these, we come right out from behind this little wall we build, and often at the hazard of our own lives, uh, will in a moment of complete thoughtlessness about self. We just go and do the thing that needs to be done. A man falls in a river. Another man who is not a good swimmer immediately jumps in after him and may drown trying to save him. The men have never met. It is not important. The instinct to help or to serve is tremendous within us. Actually, if we did not all walk around wearing these false faces of security. We would give each other many more opportunities to come out from behind masks. If our friends really knew us, they would come out from behind their mask to meet us. If we really knew them, we would come out from behind ours. But because of the constant presentation of these mask-like defenses. We do not realize that we are needed. We do not know that we are wanted. We do not know that others secretly are desperately seeking the same things that perhaps we could give them or share with them. Everyone is too proud. And pride, of course, is one of the strong points of the mask personality. It is a defense against pride injury. And to us, pride is important. We want to be proud, but we are not very certain what we are proud of. And we are not very sure that we possess anything which is the source of legitimate pride. Therefore, not being really very proud of ourselves, we are just proud without further definition. We feel that we must be. Pride, of course, has certain advantages within moderation. It helps the individual not to accept mediocrity. It helps him to desire to improve in many ways. But a pride that is not accompanied by a legitimate desire to grow becomes merely another crystallization, another fault face that may prevent us from asking what our friend really wants to give. Very often pride arises in an astonishing degree in domestic relationships. Uh, particularly is this true where both persons have careers. I know one case of a family in which uh, there was a very difficult situation due to pride. One member of the family, though deeply attached to the other, simply refused to reveal it. They would not acknowledge that they needed the other person. They would not acknowledge that they were dependent in any way. It was a powerful psychological determination to be sufficient. Now, in outer living, perhaps this is more understandable. But a, a pride which was little better, in fact, than a professional jealousy was not befitting in a truly enlightened domestic relationship. Now, the person who was too proud to show their affection was ultimately deprived of the marriage partner by death. The other person died. The one who had been too proud to admit during life their dependency wrote completely, bitterly regretted not having shown a reasonable degree of understanding, pined on for some time 
and died of a broken heart over the loss of an individual to whom they had not spoken a kind word in 15 years. Now those things can happen. This desperate defense of something, the possession of which is nothing but a burden upon the spirit. Thus pride, which is a locking power, does help to prevent the personality uh, from having any flexibility, any adjustability to the prevailing requirements of the time. It may seem nice to always be strong, but we must realize that this perpetual exhibition of strength breeds only weakness in those around us. You cannot have more than one sun in the center of a solar system or things become difficult, astronomically highly complicated. And where some individual takes on or attempts to take on the full attributes of the luminary, they are never able to attain to any situation around them except satellites. It is inevitably this way. The parent who is always strong and always right will produce weak children or will end finally in a locked conflict with children. The individual in business who is always right, regardless of the mistakes he makes, does not retain his popularity very long. No one is always right. And the effort to try to prevent other people from coming to our assistance under legitimate requirements deprives them of an opportunity to get out from behind their masks. There are moments when the best thing we can do for someone else is to try to help them to be strong by giving them responsibility and by making them feel that they are important. And so instead of this, we fight desperately on to preserve our own importance. And when a whole world does that, and it becomes a minority, a majority problem throughout the entire structure of society, there is little better than pandemonium. And behind this pandemonium, we find the causes of war, a great part of crime, and a tremendous amount of social unrest. Behind this mask which he wears, the average person is better than his mask. This is sometimes a little difficult to believe if the mask has a peculiarly formidable or grimacing appearance. But it is true. We are nearly all a little the worse for the masks that we put on. We are a little the worse because they are compromised. And man is not by nature a compromising creature. He is constantly divided. And this division destroys his own resources, weakens him, and causes him to live a lie, a life that is little better than a lie. We are never healthy while we are liars, regardless of the motives or the impulses which may cause us uh, to prevaricate. Nothing that is false has the support or strength of nature with it. All deceit weakens. All compromise weakens. And thus the individual is weakened in his effort to strengthen this objective personal instrument. Personality, from a psychological standpoint, stems from a number of sources. It is a belief which I think, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to get over. That man is, by personality, uh, the product of environment and heredity. These forces exist. Of that there is no possible doubt. But that they are the real factors, there is a grave doubt. We all know that small children are persons. 
and that their personalities are not directly traceable in all cases to our own. We know that in a family, several children will have completely different personalities, although they are biologically derived from the same heredity. There are various explanations for this involving the genes and things of that nature. But the fact remains that children are not merely miniatures of their parents, nor are they completely product of environment, because environment may be the same for the several children in a family, yet these children will not be alike. And as they grow up in life, we discover that each child reacts differently to the same or similar environmental equations. In human society, our whole world is largely one environment. This environment is, of course, broken up into many patterns. But within every environment pattern of any size or consequence, there are millions of human beings, and these millions of human beings, in each case, are in comparatively similar environmental circumstances. Yet they do not come out alike, nor nearly alike. And today, in all these equations, it is the exception that must supply the rule, because nearly everyone today is an exception. It means, then, that environment is not the cause of the personality, nor is heredity. Heredity supplies certain basic materials, and from these basic materials, bodies are built, and body is man's most intimate environment. Therefore, the chemistry of his body, its structure, functions, uh, the availability of its various mineral and other resources. These together will certainly have an effect upon temperament. They will challenge temperament. An individual who leaves a certain community, lives in another district, where he has different water and different food, will have minor changes in his personality as a result. Environment in childhood is the same thing. The majority of human beings have approximately the same early childhood environment. It differs in levels, it differs in degrees of culture. But the majority of human beings have a reasonable affection from reasonably selfish parents. Their lives will be mixtures of parental good intention and parental ignorance. We share this in common with every other part of the world. Environment may therefore have a part to play, but the part that it plays is that it acts as a catalyst. It is the, in the situation which calls upon us for certain resources. It is therefore not the environment itself, but what it draws out of us that becomes important. Man's own available supply of material for the establishment of a successful adjustment with life, this determines his probabilities of happiness or unhappiness. If the unhappy or negative or inadequate elements predominate, then it is the natural and basic function of education to supply part of this deficiency. By education, by living, by experience, the individual gains additional knowledge or additional understanding in order that he may make better adjustments between himself and his world. But actually, all that environment does is to give expression to what is inside of the person. If this inside 
is strong enough, it can resist any environment. In fact, in small children today, if it is true that the parents are molding the children, it is equally true that the children are molding the parents. And many a parent has found that it has brought into its home a little tyrant who will have its own way and will be itself regardless of anything. And the child can very often take an autocratic attitude and become practically the despot of the family. The child, therefore, brings into life its own essential nature. And this essential nature is called upon. Where it is adequate, the child makes adjustments. Where the essential nature is inadequate, the child does not make adjustment. Therefore, the adjustment or lack of it is finally based upon the adequacy of the internal, of the incarnating entity. Thus, the person is not the helpless victim of his world. He is not born in sin and conceived in iniquity. He is not predestined and foreordained to be miserable. He is brought into situations that demand resources. And his first thought should be, if his resources are inadequate, it is not the fault of society, it is the fault of himself. That he may have been placed in a difficult situation is true. But this situation is either a challenge to him to grow, or else it is a disaster to be remembered painfully throughout life. It is this, that then, that we find in connection with the personality. The personality is simply man's acceptance and rejection of the challenge of his own conduct. If his personality is not pleasant, it is because he himself cannot bestow upon it the proper attributes. If the personality is weak, it is because he cannot give it strength. If the personality is belligerent, it is because he has not the power to be temperate. Everything comes back to the individual and his own internal available resources. And life, with its ups and downs, is a chart of the use and abuse of resources. And if these are not sufficient, the answer lies in the obvious improvement of them that the individual may gain the kind of a nature in which a false front is not necessary. The majority of the world's great people have been too busy to have personalities. That is, personalities that are defended by artificial attitudes. The individuals to whom we most profoundly honor, the great spiritual and philosophical leaders of the race, have always been themselves. Sometimes, as in the case of Socrates, uh, they were deficient in some degree of personality because they could not completely alter the physical structure which they inhabited. But if, as in the case of several, the internal being became sufficiently radiant and powerful. It enveloped the physical fabric with such a glow of real life that no one cared. No one is particularly unhappy over the rugged lineaments of Abraham Lincoln. He was not handsome. He knew it. But his own peculiar kind of rugged integrity has almost become traditionally the basis of a kind of beauty. Because the man's strength of character, the strength of himself as a being, was important. Lincoln never claimed that he did not make mistakes. 
He never tried to defend or advance his own personality as a means of accomplishing anything. Those who knew him either liked him or disliked him because of what he was and because of what they were. And very often, the careful nurturing of a personality throughout life becomes so complete an occupation that the individual has no time left in which to grow and be anything. Usually, man is his best when from one cause or another, he simply forgets his personality. This brings us back to an essential principle of Buddhism, namely that the personality is, to a degree, the physical reflection of selfhood, the self-complex, the I am in man, that which is determined constantly to focus all attention upon itself, if man gains some project or undertaking that is much superior to the preservation of selfhood, if he associates his own life with a superior cause or a larger duty, he will often transmute and transform a mediocre personality into a magnificent one because more and more of his true self shines through it. Beginning then as a defense mechanism, the personality through growth is gradually re uh, refined or regenerated into a release instrument. And the only personality that is of any real value is the one by which the person releases self and gains, in a sense, a release from self. There, of course, will be objection to this idea on the ground that if some individuals just simply released themselves, they would be hopelessly obnoxious. And we are rather grateful at times that they do exercise a measure of self-control. Actually, however, the individual who releases obnoxiousness is not being himself. He is being again only a, an expression of a neurosis or a pressure which is deformed, which is abnormal within him. A person who has a serious physical deformity is very sensitive about it in many cases, whereas those with psychological abnormalities and deformities are frequently very proud of them. As many individuals have found that the only distinction that they really have is the distinction of being wrong. And if you can be wrong long enough, even this becomes an unusual situation. It is like the person whose only joy in life is to be sick, because it is the only way they can secure attention. So as long as the person desires attention, he will have temperament. He will have excess, excessive personality attributes. Obviously, we cannot simply remove personality under the existing condition and allow the libidos of all men to be dumped upon society. It would only, at the moment, increase confusion. Personality, like everything else in life, has to pass through disciplining processes. And the person in the body has got to grow until it is more beautiful than any false face that it can create. It must literally and actually possess the attributes which it tries to artificially assume. Personality can therefore give us certain lessons. We have lo noticed, of course, that a charming personality apparently impresses those around us. So what is this charm? It is the charm of graciousness, even when we are completely annoyed. It is the ability to say something pleasant when we would like to insult the individual. 
It is a great assumed interest in them when we have no interest in them, whatever. It is listening to them talk about themselves when we want to talk about ourselves. But if we have developed a skillful technique, we may still be regarded as affable. But what is this skillful technique? It is simply telling us that certain attitudes, whether they are real or not real, are necessary to the perpetuation of our social standing. Very often, the desperately assumed false face that we are wearing should be telling us the true nature we should possess. Because we should be kindly. We should take an interest in other people. But it should not be assumed. It should be factual. Wherever, therefore, the personality has graces which are assumed, then in all probability it is telling us that we should really have those graces, should possess them, and should make them so completely parts of our nature that we do not have to artificially put them on. Also, if our personality tells us that it is necessary for us to check certain attitudes, that we've got to keep a bad temper under control, that we must fight against the natural instinct to be jealous or to be envious or to be suspicious or critical. The personality is telling us that we should not be these things and that the condition which it presents is the one we should really possess, one of moderation and equilibrium. Thus, if we were really what we pretended to be, we would not only have to not have to try so hard, but we would not be in danger of this personality breaking under some kind of pressure and a very unpleasant individual pushing through. Wherever we have a false attitude, we must be constantly alert, for under certain pressures or conditions it will not hold up. If, however, the attitude is real, coming from the heart of ourselves, it will not break and we will be constantly what we try to be for the benefit of others on certain occasions. The whole problem of personality is that man, therefore, has two of these instruments, one which is artificial and one which is growing up gradually and properly within him. That which is growing up within him might be better termed his individuality. For it is the peculiar and definite things, a group of things about him that make him himself. By which he is different from others, but not necessarily better or worse. Individuality is built by strengthening those attributes by which the individual is able to attain normalcy or attain levels of function appropriate to his desires, his needs, his requirements, and the successful administration of his life. If the growth is from the inside, it will also survive and be available to man in the infinite future, for it is growth and growth alone that can survive the transition from this world to another. The personality must inevitably break at the grave, but the individuality goes on to become the basis of new personalities, which may in turn represent better adjustments. Therefore, it is very advisable not to become so personality conscious that we mistake the surface for the substance. We must build within our own natures an integration that requires no mask. This mask has other detrimental attributes. All inconsistency in life, where parts working together are not compatible, all such condition leads to friction. 
and friction is the cause of wear throughout life. Wherever, therefore, there is an inconsistency between the internal and external natures of the individual, he is wearing himself out. He is expending energy in contrary directions. He is impoverishing his vital resources, shortening his life, and increasing the probabilities of physical illness. Also, wherever it is necessary for him uh, to use will to prevent wrong action. Wherever he says, I must hold my tongue, I've got to do it. <laughs> He's just wearing himself out and other people also. We cannot say that in every instance he should just blurt out what he feels because he may blurt out things which will injure others not able to orient either and who do not realize that whatever he says is no more important than the person who says it. If he is proverbially wrong, his opinions, therefore, should not be too serious. But wherever this tension forces us constantly onto a defensive or forces us to outdo ourselves in order to maintain some level of ambition, we hasten physical decline. We destroy digestion, assimilation, respiration, and interfere with the heart action. Wherever we live, therefore, artificially, we shorten life. We also deprive ourselves of the flow, the common intermingling of vital energies by which society could be helped to grow far more rapidly. The virtue then lies always in the cultivation of factual attitudes so that masks or deceptions are not necessary. Man only plays a part because he does not know how to be himself. Growth helps him to be himself. It helps him to get over the need to borrow the elements of a character from various persons around him through aping or copying what he considers to be success. Gradually, man is able to objectify from within his own nature some of the magnificence that is naturally and properly his own. The copyist, the conformer, will not be a creator. And without creative expression, man will not grow nor will he release himself. Defense is not creativity. And the development of a series of minor abilities, simply catering to personality defense, also will not mean true creativity. Who take the child, for example, who takes music lessons because it may be a social endowment. That child is not a musician and will not be. They may learn to play adequately, but they will never be creative. The child who must have music to live is the only one who is a musician. And all the graces and all the polishes that we take on, higher education because it will help us to move in a better social circle, all these things are part of the false face of the personality. Man must be educated when he needs it. And because of the desire and impulse within himself to do things that require education. But there are thousands and millions of children today who are simply educated in order to have mere economic or social advantage. And not because they desire or want or will use education effectively. Everything that is done to bolster up the personality but has no meaning within the individual is a total loss of time and energy. In uh, this sense, that the person may be more decorative but will certainly be no more useful. Actually, then, most people 
smother their abilities behind the personality. If a new art or science appears, which si seems either profitable or perhaps uh, a little more fashionable, it will be overwhelmed uh, with students almost immediately. Some new art or science comes along, immediately schools are opened and thousands study it. Yet many of these who study are not studying because of aptitude or real desire to know the subject, but simply because it is new and offers an immediate future. These persons are not permitting their own creativity to have an expression. They join a school on, ele on electronics or atomics because this is the profession of the future. Actually, inside himself, the individual may have always had a wonderful opportunity to release himself by being a shoemaker. But shoemaking does not contribute to a wonderful false front. There was a time in which shoemaking probably did contribute to a magnificent personal equilibrium. In the days of dear old Hans Sock, the shoemaker of Nuremberg. Shoemakers wore long coats and walked at the head of the citizenry. A good shoemaker was known all over the province in which he lived. Apprentices came and surrounded him, sat at his feet uh, to learn how to use the master secrets of his trade. He had pride, honor, sense of distinction, and he would never under any condition think of turning out an inferior pair of shoes. He was consequential and sat in the seats of the mighty. He was part of the city council. He was a man of serious value and perhaps the master of his guild, itself a tremendously vital social cultural achievement. So man in those days had not overcome or outgrown the idea that dignity lay in doing the thing you wanted to do and could do and did well, and that regardless of the labor, if it was useful, it was great. It was important. Instead of that today, we have a few learned professions deluged with students of mediocre ability simply because they will gain distinction. The subject will collapse, but they will gain distinction. And the result is that practically every learned profession we have is becoming more and more subject to public ridicule because it is no longer represented by those who really believe it. Everywhere we build the personality and lose principles. And where we do this individually or collectively, we suffer. It is therefore most important to realize that the only use that the personality has, actually, is that it is our means of communication with others, by means of which we can let them know what we are. And if we have become skilled or artist, if we have become informed or improved, if experience in living has enriched us, the personality is the channel for the expression of these things we have known and done in order that other men may share with us and that we may share with them to the natural growth and improvement of our collective society. When the personality is anything except this, it is a most troublesome and erratic thing, more likely to make us sick than well and more likely to cause us to be ultimate failures than ultimate successes. So reduce personality by reducing the need for it. And whatever you have assumed and have tried to play through the personality, if it is really important, master it so that you no longer have to assume it. Become sufficiently proficient in it. Become so informed in it that you reach that degree of information which is the sign of genius, namely that degree in which you have discovered how little you know 
and how much you must know. The moment you become truly informed on a subject, you will become moderate in it. You will find it no longer a universal panacea for everything, but a, an ever-present help in time of some kind of trouble. You will also gain a greater and greater tendency to be silent and to listen, because each thing you discover reveals more of ignorance than knowledge, and by degrees this audacity, this dictatorial arrogance, which is the certain indication of inferiority, will disappear, because it cannot abide where an individual simply and honestly faces facts. We find no one who was more humble on matters of electricity than Edison. We know no one who was more willing to admit what he, what he did not know about atomics than Einstein. And yet these individuals were profoundly learned, but they were simple persons who made no effort to conceal ignorance behind the bluff, but who were perfectly willing to state what they knew and what they did not know, and were learning till the day they died. This is good. This relaxes the problem and makes it possible for us to live quietly and gently. Makes it possible for us to have a truly lovable personality rather than a merely brittle one. And when people who know us and love us find that behind the personality is the same thing that was in front of it, that the individual is solid all the way through, with his attitudes, his convictions, and his ideals, then we will generally be respected. And we will gather around us those who appreciate values, and others are hardly worth gathering. So we can build upon the internal a kind of expression that is our true selves. There is no longer the problem of being artificial. We can relax, fully knowing that under any condition, we will be true to that which we are. So this building of substance, rather than the continual supporting of shadow, will give us the kind of personality that will be suitable for a long pull and will bring us through when the glittering personalities have fallen away because they could not live up to the bluff which they have attempted to maintain. Keep the personality uh, simple. Keep the principles strong. And understand more and more about humanity. And in your own heart, you will be kind, you will be understanding, you will be helpful, and you will have that kind of nature that will be more and more called upon by others who are in need, and you will have closer and more sincere relationships with those around you. The personality can be perfected, but only when as an artificial or intellectual concept it is absorbed in the spiritual force moving through and from the center of man. So the true personality is the total nature coming through without fear and without doubt. For wherever there is fear or doubt, there is ignorance. And once we have overcome this, we can be ourselves, and we will not find that it is hazardous. It is only hazardous when ourselves, we are not what we should be. So keep the personality from being too strong, and build the principles stronger behind it. And your days will be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and your affairs will go well. And like in the story in the Bible, the Lord will bless the latter end of Job and make it more fruitful than the beginning. And we can, through quiet growth, achieve all the good things and present at the same time to the world an honest face which our friends will love and our enemies will respect if we have any left. <laughs> well, I guess that's all we can do for us. Now, I'd like to make uh, one or two announcements about our musical affair last Friday evening. I think a good many of you were there.
We think it was a very beautiful program and very appropriate to the anniversary. The artists contributed splendidly, and everyone did everything possible to make it a desirable and happy occasion. And we have talked to a number who were present, and they felt the same way about it. I'd like to add in, uh, that uh, the various facilities of the community, all of the major networks of radio and television, and all the press services cooperated and uh, did everything possible to make this helpful. Uh, the uh, Consul General of Austria has asked me to convey to all who helped and participated in this event the appreciation of his government. I might also add uh, that before the performance, a news release was prepared in German, describing the entire event, which was held to be extraordinary because it was sponsored by a philosophical organization rather than a musical or social one something which apparently has not often occurred on that level of music. And this entire broadcast in German was sent by the Voice of America to Europe, was reported in Austria, and also went behind the Iron Curtain. So that the appreciation of music lovers throughout Europe and the area where Mozart is greatly loved uh, will be added, at least silently, to that of those who were present. We thank all of you for helping to make this a very good occasion. We appreciate the co-sponsorship of the governor of the state and our state senator, and also the uh, co-sponsorship and helpfulness of persons like Mr. and Mrs. Jack Warner and Mr. and Mrs. Bob Hope. Everyone sort of got into it before it was over to try to make it a very interesting and useful uh, cultural achievement, something that will help to bridge the interval between philosophy and the arts a very, very important program, by the way. I'd like to also now call to your attention our subject for next Sunday morning, the human mind and the concept of time. On this problem, we're going to see how busy you are. You haven't a moment. You are rushed to death. You will hardly live to make it. The tyranny of time in the life of the person the psychology and even the psychosis of the time factor is prodding us all strangely and mysteriously. So next Sunday morning we're going to talk about it a little. I'd like to call attention also to the fact that this afternoon at uh, our headquarters at 2 o'clock, the Philosophical Research Society Center Study Group will meet. 2 o'clock, everyone who is interested is invited to attend, and discussions will be based on the various books, publications, and activities of our society. I suspect some of mine will get into it. So uh, we hope that you will be present on this occasion. I'd like to also say that we have brought down a few more used books from a library that we have recently purchased. No, we don't have any more of the bargains we offered last week. We told you that was final, and it was. But we do have a number of interesting books, very reasonably priced, if you're gathering libraries or building collections. I'm sure we want to break the rule that was advertised lately, which stated only 17% of the American people read books. I'm quite certain that in the groups we work with, 95% read books. Therefore, we have also a little reputation for literacy, which sometime might even become newsworthy. We might also call to your attention two of our booklets, which have interesting material for the subject of the morning. One is a vital concept of personal growth, which is based upon a lecture which we gave here. And the other is the positive uses of psychic energy. These will help uh, to strengthen uh, our understanding of the rules and laws governing the growth and development of the individual and his personality. So we hope that you will all visit the book table we thank you again for your help and cooperation in the musical event last Friday evening. I hope to see you again next Sunday morning.